modern era wargamers to the Op Center, your source for command level, gaming focused deep dives into military conflicts around the world in the modern era. I am your host, Ariskany, part of the SITREP podcast team. This is our channel dedicated to bringing you modern military content on Podbean, on Tabletop.com, YouTube, and Twitch. If this is the kind of material that interests you, consider giving this video a like. You can also drop a comment, follow us on YouTube or Twitch, or support us on Patreon. We also have great merchandise available at Zazzle.com. So I want to thank everyone who supported our first four episodes, a rather expansive look at the Arab-Israeli Wars from 1956 to the present day. But now let's switch to a very different modern conflict. This was a highly requested subject among our community, so because you asked for it, we're setting sail to the South Atlantic for a look at the Falklands War of 1982. The Falklands War was fought between Argentina and the United Kingdom between April and June 1982. What makes this war special among modern conflicts is that it's fought between the formal militaries of two industrialized nations. This is quite rare in the modern era, where most conflicts are some sort of civil war or asymmetrical counterinsurgency kind of operation. The Falklands also saw significant air forces on both sides as well as two formal navies pitted against each other. This is something you practically never see in the modern era, where naval operations are usually along the lines of anti-piracy actions or interdiction of smugglers, that kind of thing. So for the Falklands, I'm breaking this material into three episodes. Episode 1 today will cover the general background and context of the war, as well as the Argentinian invasion and the initial British response. Part 2 will cover the naval and air war around and over the Falklands, where we'll be using the Naval Command System by Rory Crabb and Air War C-21 System by David Manley, Paul Minson, and Larry Freeman of Wessex Games. Part 3 will put our boots on the ground, where we see the ground combat aspect of the Falklands War. For this, we'll use Valor and Victory, originally written for World War II by Barry Doyle, as well as perhaps some miniature gaming, maybe using systems like Spectre or Ultra Combat. But for now, let's get started and take a look at how this unlikely conflict came to pass. The Falklands are an archipelago of small, remote islands located far in the South Atlantic, just 400 kilometers from the southern mainland of Argentina. It's important to remember just how far south the Falklands really are. They're just 1,200 kilometers from the nearest point of Antarctica. The Falklands are also very small. Between the two main islands, East and West Falkland, and hundreds of smaller islands, their total land mass adds up to just 80% that of Northern Ireland, and half the U.S. state of New Hampshire. Less than 3,000 people lived here in 1982, and despite being mostly British in descent, at the time of the conflict they didn't even enjoy full British citizenship. The Falklands are also 12,700 kilometers from London. That's over 8,000 miles. Yet for centuries, they had been seen as an integral holding of British overseas territory. And therein lies the problem. Ever since declaring independence from Spain in 1816, Argentina has considered these islands, the Islas Malvinas as they call them, part of their sovereign territory. Looking at a map, we can see that these islands are indeed right there on Argentina's strategic doorstep. Geographic proximity notwithstanding, there were also questions about Spain and Britain sharing these islands during Argentina's colonial period, yet Argentinian possession of these islands was never suitably addressed after Argentina broke away from Spain. Now, I'm not going to plod through 150 years of territorial diplomacy here. Suffice it to say that Britain had administered these islands for years, or really centuries, and had fought to protect them during World War I. Argentina, meanwhile, remained equally adamant in the claim of the Islas Malvinas. By the late 1960s, in fact, deals were in the works to peaceably turn these Falklands over to Argentina. Events of the early 1980s, however, destabilized the situation and put Britain and Argentina on the course for war. To put this very quickly, in the early 1980s, Argentina was in political chaos. A so-called dirty war had simmered for years in the country, with junta regimes rapidly replacing each other with repeated waves of violence, assassinations, and civil strife. 
In 1981, General Leopoldo Galtieri was head of the latest military junta to seize power in Argentina. Now he had rebels teeming in the mountains, citizens were rioting in the streets, the economy was nearing 100% inflation, thousands of political, quote, disappearances were putting Argentina in all the wrong headlines. Given all the other problems on his plate, it seems incredible that Galtieri had any time to worry about Argentina's claim to the Islas Malvinas. Yet by the beginning of 1982, Galtieri and his generals had set up a plan to reclaim the islands once and for all. You see, for decades, the idea of claiming the Islas Malvinas was a vein of incredible patriotic pride in the Argentinian population. Galtieri hoped that by snatching these islands on a bold move, they could unite the people behind his leadership and stabilize Argentina's many other problems. Given the state of the UK at the time, the plan didn't actually seem that far-fetched. Britain's economy was failing, facing the highest unemployment since the Great Depression. The government was quite unpopular at the moment and was also drawing up plans to drastically cut back military spending, including scrapping many of the warships that would ironically serve with distinction in the upcoming conflict. The Royal Navy and Air Force seemed hardly capable of sending a full-scale invasion force 12,000 kilometers around the world, much less to reclaim two tiny, barely inhabited islands that some people in the UK had actually been working for years to give to Argentina anyway. The Argentinian plan started not in the Falklands, but in the South Georgia Islands, another island group even further out into the South Atlantic. Here, Argentinian metal workers contracted to scrap old whaling facilities were soon joined by a detachment of Argentinian Marines. They abruptly raised the Argentinian flag and more or less dared the British to do something about it. Well, if the Argentinians were testing the British for a response, they certainly got one. Immediately, the Antarctic survey ship HMS Endurance was dispatched from the Falklands to South Georgia carrying a platoon of 22 Royal Marines and two missile-armed WASP-class attack helicopters. This was really the only Royal Navy presence in the entire South Atlantic at the time, but she was headed straight for South Georgia. There was also a huge outcry in the British press. One thing was clear, domestic troubles or not, the British would not be pushed around in the South Atlantic. This unexpected British response caused the Argentinians to accelerate their plans for the main invasion of the Falkland Islands. Originally Operation Azul, or Blue, this was scheduled for late June or July. This is the depth of the winter in the southern hemisphere, and the Argentinians hoped that the appalling weather conditions would make a British response all the less likely. Now a new plan, Operation Rosario, had to be fast-tracked for immediate launch. The junta gave the final orders on the night of March 25, 1982. Vice Admiral Juan Jose Lombardo, Chief of Naval Operations, oversaw feverish, round-the-clock preparations until March 28, when Task Force 40 and other formations of the Argentinian Navy sailed from Puerto Belgrano to the Falklands. By the night of April 1st and 2nd, 1982, the Argentinian invasion of the Falkland Islands was on. The Argentinian submarine Santa Fe and the destroyer Santissima Trinidad covertly landed divers and a small detachment of Buzo Tactico Commandos. The Trinidad was ironically a Type 42 class destroyer, a sister ship of the exact same class as three of the British destroyers that we would see later featured in the same conflict. As the sun came up, the ex-American LST or tank landing ship Cabo San Antonio and the transport ship Isla de los Estados put forth another 900 troops, mostly from the Argentinian 2nd Marine Battalion. These were supported by 18 American-made LVTP-7 Amtrak or amphibious armored assault vehicles, the uh, same type used by the U.S. Marine Corps. Fire support came from the Santissima Trinidad and her sister ship Hercules, along with the French-built frigates Drummond and Granville. Operational support was provided by the flagship of the Argentinian Navy, the aircraft carrier Viento Cinco de Mayo, escorted by a few more former American destroyers. The British force available to resist this invasion was hopelessly outmatched. Major Mike Norman 
had actually more than the normal amount of men on hand, because the Argentinian invasion just happened to take place during a switch-out of British garrison units. But even with these extra men, he only had 68 marines, about 28 armed locals, and 11 sailors. Actually, out of those 68 marines, 22 of them were missing, having just debarked aboard HMS Endurance, and they were, again, currently en route to South Georgia. Still, the remaining Royal Marines on hand put up the very best fight they could. Fighting in Stanley, the capital town of the Falkland Islands, they fell back in stages to Government House. They managed to lightly damage one of the Argentinian Amtraks and wound several of the Argentinian soldiers. They even managed to capture three of them momentarily and mortally wounded one of their platoon leaders. But once Government House was surrounded by Amtraks with heavy machine guns, and under fire from Argentinian warships, Governor Rex Hunt authorized the surrender. The Marines were disarmed, but reportedly well-treated and flown back to the United Kingdom. In the immediate aftermath, Galtieri and his government couldn't possibly be more pleased. The invasion had got off without a hitch. The people of Argentina were overjoyed. Galtieri seemed to have solved all of Argentina's problems overnight. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Throughout the British nation and government, outrage was widespread, united, and immediate. Britain's Iron Lady, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, was hardly a universally popular figure before the invasion, but when she announced that an immediate expedition would be mounted to take back the Falklands, British public united behind their armed forces as they hadn't done perhaps since 1945. As we'd seen with Operation Rosario, the British counter-invasion, or Operation Corporate, was mounted in extreme haste. Remember that these Argentinian junta governments were known for disappearing people by the thousands, and at the time no one knew for sure what, if anything, was happening to the people of the Falkland Islands. Also, British planners needed this invasion off the water and on the ground before that southern winter really set in in June or July. Yet the obstacles against Operation Corporate were incredible. Like we keep saying, the Falklands were over 12,000 kilometers away, and the Royal Navy was hardly the world-dominating force it had been in previous decades. Even at its height, the Royal Navy had never possessed this kind of strategic power projection, putting whole armies on the ground directly into combat thousands of miles from home. The Argentinians, by contrast, could reinforce the Falklands from their mainland bases only 400 kilometers away. That's one thirtieth the distance. Only two small aircraft carriers were available to form the nucleus of the Naval Task Force. That's HMS Hermes and HMS Invincible. These were two older ships that had actually been considered for scrap only shortly before. Nor were these ships carriers in the true sense capable of launching supersonic fighters to win air superiority against an enemy land-based air force. Instead, they could launch only the relatively untested Sea Harrier, which used the new Vertical Takeoff and Landing, or VTOL, propulsion concept. A quick note, Sea Harriers and the RAF land-based Harrier variant, these are not fighters, these are strike aircraft. Yet they'd have to perform as fighters against supersonic, French-built Mirages, former Israeli Daggers, Mirage 5s, and American-made A-4 Skyhawks. We'll cover this more in the Air War portion of our series, but suffice it to say that on top of these limitations, Hermes and Invincible could only carry about 25 Harriers between them, against the 200-plus combat aircraft of the Argentinian Air Force and Navy. Undaunted, the Royal Navy set out on its mission. Using Ascension Island as a halfway staging base, the task force pressed on in several groups toward the Falklands. In addition to the two carriers, we see a screen of destroyers and frigates, landing ships, tankers, uh, and different parts of the task force would include many civilian ships requisitioned for use in Operation Corporate. These were mostly used as supply ships and troop transports, and included container ships like the Atlantic Conveyor, the passenger liners SS Canberra, and MV Queen Elizabeth II. Meanwhile, more fighting was already underway. The Argentinian frigate Garrico had arrived at South Georgia, carrying more Argentinian troops to reinforce the Marines already there. 
A small but fierce battle took place on April 3rd between these Argentinian troops and a platoon of Royal Marines on the island. An Argentinian Puma-class helicopter was shot down, but once under fire from the Garrico's deck guns, Royal Marine Lieutenant Mills had no choice but to surrender. South Georgia had now been taken by the Argentinians as well. As the British battle group sailed toward the Falklands, the first problem they would face would be the Argentinian Navy. On April 28th, the British declared a 200-mile exclusion zone all around the Falklands, warning that any Argentinian warship or aircraft that entered that zone would be engaged and destroyed. The Argentinians, for their part, were initially undeterred, setting up task forces of their own, one built around the Vienta de Cinco de Mayo, north of the Falklands, and one around the old American cruiser Belgrano, south of the Falklands. British submarines Splendid and Conqueror had been dispatched to find and, if necessary, sink these flagships, but nobody knew if these subs would find their targets before the British arrived. Meanwhile, British counterattacks were already underway. The destroyer Antrim and the frigate Plymouth had broken off from the task force and were headed to South Georgia, intent on taking these islands back first. The Argentinian troops there had since been further reinforced by 40 more Marines aboard the submarine Santa Fe. But this submarine was quickly disabled by helicopters launched from the British warships. Another helicopter mission to land SAS troops on South Georgia ended in near disaster, however, after two of the helicopters crashed. Despite this setback, once British troops managed to get ashore and the Argentinians were put under British naval gunfire, they quickly surrendered. Virtually without bloodshed, already Britain had won her first victory. Things in the Falklands, however, were just getting started. As they approached the 200-mile exclusion zone, the British Task Force Commander, Rear Admiral John Woodward, faced a multi-layered naval and air defense. Argentinian Air Force jets could be based on Stanley Field on the Falklands, plus Navy Skyhawks from the Argentinian carrier and French-made Exocet cruise missiles launched from the Belgrano and other Argentinian warships. Airstrikes could also be launched from bases all up and down the Argentinian coast. Yet the British had a plan to knock some of these spokes out of this Argentinian defense wheel. And as the last peace initiatives finally died away toward May 1st, 1982, the time had come for the British to put their plan into action. British fleet entered the Falklands exclusion zone, marking something of a line of no return. The first British strike missions finally got the go code, and at almost the exact same moment, HMS Conqueror had just found the Argentinian cruiser General Belgrano. The Falklands War was about to begin in earnest. So I hope you've enjoyed our opening Op Center episode on the Falklands War. I know we had a lot to set up here, folks, but please rest assured, we have at least two more episodes to go on this topic where we are really going to get stuck into it. For today's Q&A, STL Warrior from On Tabletop adds, thanks for the reminder about Operation Cast Lead. A quick note, Cast Lead was an incursion by Israeli forces into Gaza from December 2008 to January 2009. He continues, I almost forgot about that one. It ended almost as well as the first Israeli invasion, as I recall. The Prime Minister was pushed out, then went to jail, if I remember correctly. Okay, first of all, STL Warrior is being a little too generous with me here. In part four of our Arab-Israeli War series, we only breezed by the two Intifada uprisings and mentioned the 2006 invasion of Lebanon. In regards to Gaza, we talked briefly about how the separation of Egyptian national policy from Palestinian affairs in Gaza and the decline of leftist Palestinian groups like the PLO gave rise to new groups like Hamas. But yes, the first Gaza war of 2008-09 was largely disappointing for the IDF, who didn't capture any major Hamas leaders or even completely stop Hamas rocket strikes into southern Israeli settlements. The Prime Minister at the time, Ehud Olmert, did come under a lot of fire for this war, and many groups, both in and out of Gaza, sought to have IDF officers brought up on war crime charges. This was a very controversial war, folks. 
but Hamas did more or less start the war with large rocket attacks on December 24th and 25th, 2008. Yet Israeli forces also used some very questionable tactics, like allegedly dropping white phosphorus over civilian areas. Olmert did eventually step down and would face charges and serve time, but from what I can tell, these convictions had more to do with finances and didn't really relate to Castled or the Gaza War. Remember, folks, you can ask a question or post a comment on either on Tabletop or YouTube, and maybe we'll get to it in a future video. Meanwhile, you can follow us on Twitch, subscribe to us on YouTube, or find us on ontabletop.com and Podbean. You can also support the SitRep Podcast on Patreon, or check out our merchandise at zazzle.com slash sitreppodcast. So that's going to wrap us up for today, everyone. Please be sure to check out our next episode, where we crack open how the Falklands War can really unfold on the tabletop. For now, this is Ariskany, and Tango Mike for listening.